should you be allowed to insult freely what somebody else holds dear? Should you be able to say what you like about me and the things that matter to me? And is that an essential human freedom? See, the secularist will say yes. The secularist will say that it is his inalienable social right to insult somebody else's faith and religion. And there, there are reasons for that. He, he's, he's dealing with things that somebody else, not himself, holds dear. And he doesn't understand the person of faith who is deeply hurt. I'm, I'm not blaming him, he doesn't get it. Uh, by his insulting his own precious things. Um, the nearest you can get to letting the secularist understand perhaps what he's doing is, is to question whether it, somebody else has the right to insult his wife or his child. It's not, it's not a perfect comparison, but um, it's the nearest we're going to get for them because they, they haven't got this other thing in their life that matters a lot to them. They don't get it, they don't understand it because they're a secularist. They don't see the sensitivity because they haven't got it. And you can understand that. The secularist, therefore, is going to say it's perfectly legitimate. Uh, in fact, it's one of his essential freedoms for him to be allowed to mock and insult the things that people of faith, whatever that faith happens to be, what they hold dear. And we can understand to this extent. Now, now, when it comes to people of faith and their view of the question, should you be allowed to insult something that somebody else holds dear, the cake gets cut one of two ways. Most religions say, if you insult that which I hold most dear, then I have the right to be so affronted by you, I do something to you as a result. So, quite famously this week, of course, in, in, in the situation with Islam. I've looked at some of the cartoons that Charlie Hebdo, this, this uh, office that's been so brutally attacked and people have been violently killed, which we don't approve of, do we? I've looked at some of the things they've been saying, it's in French, but that's okay, about Islam, about what they hold dear. And I could understand that it would be a severe affront. But the cake gets cut two ways. At this point, what do you do about that? Most religions will take the sort of response that, that Muslims have taken in recent weeks. Christianity, on the other hand, takes a different view. And that's precisely the point of the passage today. Because in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, the focus shifts from what it's going to cost Jesus to get salvation for us, onto the basic cost and condition of discipleship, following that Jesus. So, Je suis Charlie, or Je suis poursuivant de Jésus. Sorry about that. That came from I don't know where, it wasn't in the notes. But you know what, what it means? I'm a follower of Jesus. What happens when Jesus is affronted, is insulted, is mocked, is rejected, and suffers? He carries his cross. He bears what he has to bear to be faithful to God. Takes it. And that is not the way most religions approach this sort of issue. It is the Christian way. So in Mark 8.34, the focus shifts onto this. Verse 34, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And you can see there in the picture on the screen, there is the cross beam of the cross with a shadow of the cross falling across it. Because what he's envisaging here is the man who goes out to crucifixion being required to pick up the cross beam that he's go on, going to go on and be nailed to and carry it to the point of execution and they'll be crucified Dick France makes it clear in, in his commentary that what's being implied here is that a basic condition of Christian discipleship is to join Jesus on the way to execution 
and Dick France goes on, the metaphor of taking up one's cross is not to be domesticated into an exhortation, merely to endure hardship patiently. Of course, you can apply it that way. But he says, the primary reference in the context must be to the possibility of literally dying, of literal death, he says. And yet, of course, the immediate context is one of denying oneself. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. That's the first thing. And then take up their cross and follow me. So, you want to be my disciple? You want to be my follower? Following Jesus, according to Jesus, means not being self-centred and not being self-serving, but being God-centred and God-serving prepared to follow him in the way of the cross. Denying your own self, taking up your own cross, and following Jesus. Following Jesus is dependent on the previous two, denying yourself and picking up your cross. That's what's entailed in following Jesus. You cannot have the latter, following me, without the two that go before it. Did anyone ever mention that? It's the point Jesus makes as soon as they've realised that he is the Messiah. As soon as they've realised who he is in terms of the kingdom of God and the unfolding plan of salvation, as soon as Peter has said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who do men say I am? This one and that one and the other one. Yeah, but you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed it to you. My Father in heaven's revealed this to you. Fantastic. Well done. And then he starts telling them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Yeah? And Peter rebels and gets his wrist slapped in some uncertain fashion, okay? No uncertain fashion. Um, and uh, then Jesus says, look, this is the bottom line. The Son of Man must suffer, and this is what it implies for followers. You walk away the cross. So when flat comes your way because you love and serve God, because you love and serve the Lord Jesus, here's what's happening. We as Christians have a developed theology of suffering, of rejection, of dying of walking the way of the cross and not all do not all religions do we do because this is following the saviour in the way of the cross he wasn't cool we don't serve up cool have you noticed we don't serve up cool uh, he wasn't cool put that down deny yourself that if that conflicts with Christian discipleship what we're talking about is not some, somebody recently described a, a lot of the sort of uh, popular evangelicalism in inverted commas of the United States and it was, it was from that culture being directed back at itself and the guy said, um, <clears throat> he, he described moralistic therapeutic deism, you know these sort of preachers were like self-help, <laughs> yeah? Jesus is there to make your life better and make you a happier person and make you thrive and prosper. You know, moralistic, therapeutic deism. It's not Christianity, he says, because you follow Jesus in the way of the cross, if that's what it takes. No, Christianity is following a crucified Messiah and gladly and willingly embracing that and walking behind him gladly. He went to the cross. Didn't have to. But his doing so was not only my hope, but also my present salvation. So, I embrace the suffering that sent me for the gospel's sake. Now this isn't the stuff you understand that comes to me by virtue of the fall. It's the stuff that comes to me by virtue of Christ and his walk the way of the cross and his salvation and my discipleship. It's not the stuff that comes to me because I'm ill like everybody else. Specifically, Obviously, the way we handle that, it applies to that as well. But specifically, he's talking about the things that come our way because we follow Jesus. The price we pay because we follow him. Uh, now, that may be in our experience of hardship and suffering. We take it in a certain way. We handle it in a certain way. And faithfully, we, we live through that. Yeah? But that's the cost to us then. Do, do you see what I mean? There's an overlap here. He's talking about how we handle hard experience. Uh, but it's not just the fact of sickness, of childbearing, of child rearing, of death. It's the stuff that comes my way because I go through all those things in a certain way because of the gospel of salvation. I go through all those things following Christ and being faithful to him, following him. It's everyone who wants to be his disciple. Did you notice that? Whoever. 
Jesus calls the crowd to him. He's not just talking to the twelve now. It's not everybody who wants to be my disciple. And then it says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. <clears throat> He's saying, those who wish to follow him have got to be prepared to shift their centre of gravity of their life away from... Um, <sighs> Well, living, pleasing themselves, to concern themselves. Towards living, to following him. Uh, Lane, in his old commentary, and Lane, Lane's old commentary has been, been great on this for me this week. What is this deny themselves thing? Lane says it is a sustained willingness to say no to oneself in order to be able to say yes to God. That's great, isn't it? As simple as that. Everyone, whoever, wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Um, self-idolatry has got to be deliberately killed off if you're going to worship Jesus. And most people are engaged in self-idolatry. So you can't just go by the way they do things. The people around you do things. This is Jesus' worship, not self-idolatry. Walking in the way of the cross. And it's a serious demand, and it's reinforced by this description of the Christ-following life as a sustained death march. Um, you know, they've they got this going on in, in the States, and they've got this huge rate of execution in America. And it's right up there with the worst in the world. And, and they have this sort of ritual where, you know, a man comes out of the condemned cell and he starts walking down the corridor in his orange boiler suit, or how, however they do it, and, and they shout, dead man walking. Yeah, it's his death march. And really, really, that is what Jesus picks up here. And that is the imagery that he uses to explain what he means uh, in, in this, this call to discipleship. Jesus is pictured using the picture of a condemned man going out to die, forced to carry on his back the cross beam he's going to be nailed to when he finally gets to the place of execution. And by the time Mark writes this, the stark reality of that has come home. It's come home to Jesus because he has been crucified. And it's coming home to those Christians in Rome that Mark is writing this gospel for. Because they're knowing that experience too by now. So by now you're saying to me, why on earth, right? <laughs> why on earth would anybody want anything to do with that? There's a rationale to be had. Why on earth would anybody tie themselves up in that? be clear, by calling the crowd to him, Jesus is saying everybody. All disciples reckon with following a crucified Messiah, also expect to make sacrifices and to suffer yourself, to deny yourself, to refuse a, li a life to live a, a self-centered existence, to deny oneself in order to follow Christ. It plainly hurts oneself to follow Christ. Um, again, Lane, you see, this older commentary. Get, get this. It was the Lord's intention, he says, that those who follow him should not be detached observers of his passion. To, to watch is not to fully understand. That's the implication of what Lane is saying. Do you get that? To just see it. It's not to fully understand. But men who grow in faith and understanding through particip participation in his sufferings, they're the guys who begin to get it. Through sharing in that experience, you begin to understand something of the love of Jesus that without it you don't am I making sense here? just tell me if I'm not there's no cabbage to throw but there are chairs, don't throw chairs whosoever then if they're going to understand this if they're going to walk in this way if they're going to be disciples we need to be part of that guys the rationale why do that? Why set out on the road that follows Jesus on the way to the cross? Think about it, a good bunch of those Christians living in persecuting Rome at the heart of its evil empire, surely they would have entertained the same question. Why would I do that? Why would I do that? Don't you think people living in northern Iraq today, any Christians left in Kurdistan inside Iraq, don't you think they've asked themselves that question? Don't you think the Christians living in northeast Nigeria have asked themselves that question? Christians living in Somalia today they've asked themselves that question Kazakhstan what is the rationale for embracing this following of Jesus in the way of the cross there is a clear a distinct rationale that Jesus 
highlights here and he uses the language of commerce and trade and business to work out the quid pro quo, you know, the pros and the cons. Cost-benefit analysis, better not use that expression, it means something technical. Um, but you know what I mean, in the roughest of terms. Why would I do that? Well, it's, 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 we're in a situation where Jesus is clearly the acknowledged Messiah now. He is the one. He is the content of the message. It's all about you, Jesus. The underlying theme of the second half of this Gospel of Mark, it's all, it's all Jesus. And here's the principle. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me, it's all about Jesus, and for the Gospel, the message is paramount, they will save it. They'll save their life. By losing your life in that way, you will save your life for eternity. This is, this is an investment equation. Mm. Well, that's the way he's putting it at this point. You see the point? Here's the principle. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Here is the appeal to reason. If anyone is... Uh, uh, here's the reason in verses 36 and 7. What have we got there? Sorry, the glasses take a while to focus these days. You've got to get the right part of the lens. Uh, See, I didn't, and I've got Mark 6, not Mark 8. Give me a second. Okay. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? There's the business language, exchange. It's the language of exchange and trade. If anyone, what, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world, forfeit his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Plain, it's clear, it's unmistakable. Christian discipleship is not about confirmation class or ceremonies or certificates, okay? It fo means following a rejected, suffering, crucified Messiah who saves his people by his suffering and calls them to understand what he's done and to appreciate what he's done and to rejoice in what he's done by following him in the way of the cross. You want to understand? I don't understand the cross. I don't get it. I don't understand the love of God. Mm, here's the way. Here's how we study. We follow him in that way. And Jesus is using that language. Commerce, profit, loss, gain, exchange. Here's the transaction. A comparison of values is made. How do the profit and loss projections look on this one? What will it profit me? If I gain the whole temporary world around me and lose my own soul for eternity. Here is the equation. You lose the whole world, you lose your eternity by the denial of Jesus. Watch that. Um, last Thursday, uh, it was an important day in uh, Protestant hagiography. Um, last Thursday was January the 8th and it saw the anniversary of the death of a group of young men, including a missionary who was called Jim Elliot. Do you know the story? Have you seen the film Through Gates of Splendour? You've read the book, see? OM. I mean, that's the background, didn't it? Have a book. Uh, we'll sell you a book. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great, great, great story. In 1957, I think, January the 8th, um, a group of young men flew in as missionaries to the cannibalistic Oka Indians, the Huaroni people of Ecuador. And they were known to be a fearsome tribe. They were known to be a cannibalistic tribe. And the guys flew in and they were killed. I think they were killed that day. And what happened next was that their wives went. And Elizabeth Elliot and a group of women went. And the tribe are Christian to this day. Right. They were all converted as a tribe. But those guys gave their lives. And those guys had been reckoning with this whole issue of putting your life on the line for the Lord for a long, long time. They'd gone through Wheaton College and trained there. A number of them and friends got together and off they went. <coughs> And Jim Elliot had kept a journal for a long time. Uh, and he became famous, really, for that journal in, in many ways, and what had happened with those Indians. And his journal entry for the October the 28th, 1949, uh, it really expresses this belief that work dedicated to Jesus lasts, it's worth having, more important than, than your own temporary life. He wrote this famous quote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Right? He's no fool gives what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. 
it's sort of a, a mashup, really, of Philip Henry, a, a 17th century uh, Puritan preacher. Uh, Philip Henry said, he is no fool who parts with that which he cannot keep when he's sure to be recompensed with that which he cannot lose. And there's the logic. There's the logic. Why do you, do you get it? It's crucial that those who call themselves Christians do get it because getting or not getting it carries consequences. And, and Jesus comes to that in verse 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and of my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the Holy Angels. Jesus is very plain about the consequence of not following him in a committed fashion. Now we're dealing in an age, right, where young people find it really hard to make commitment. It's something we know about our age, it's something we know about our culture, we know about our young people. And we can feel that too. Commitment is a problem. To anything. Jesus is saying, following Jesus means following him in a committed fashion. This is what it takes. By the way, Jesus is claiming here to be more than the Son of Man. By talking about when he comes in his Father's glory, Jesus is referring back to the Daniel 7 passage about the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes in glory into the heavenly throne room, mounts the steps and sits on the throne with the Ancient of Days, right? He's claiming to be God here. That's just by the by, because you know I read these hard books for you, right? And you know I do all the painful work on that and take the paracetamols, right? So that, that's what's going on there. That's what Jesus is claiming to be. This is who he's claiming to be. I am the one who sits on the throne with the Ancient of Days and I rule the universe. By the way, now if you're not going to be committed to me, here's a problem. If you're ashamed of me in this, yeah, adulterous and sinful generation that wanders away from its God and rebels and makes it hard for those who seek to follow, then sorry guys, the Son of Man is going to be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with all his angels, holy angels. See, it is not being able to mouth the summaries of the gospel that save you. It is seeing and living the implications of the gospel. And why is that so important? I found this from Banksy on the interweb. <clears throat> and I think it's a very recent Banksy. And I think it's possibly a response to the Charlie Hebdo thing. Uh, I, I, I just don't, I don't understand Banksy. Sometimes he says such right things and sometimes he doesn't. But that just seems, rings so right with me. There's a guy washing the graffiti off the wall which says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. And he's just got the T and the Y and the I a bit sm smudged and blurry as he's trying to clear the graffiti off the wall. What we do in life echoes in eternity. You're not going to be able to wash that off the wall. Jesus is saying that. He's saying commitment to Jesus, following Jesus means consistency, because what we do in life echoes in eternity. There are going to be consequences for being ashamed of the Son of Man in a sinful and an adulterous generation. But faithfulness leads to life. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Why is it so important? <clears throat> because the criterion for a man's acceptance or rejection before the Son of Man in glory is his loyalty or disloyalty to Jesus now. It's about our commitment to following him in the way of the cross. So back to our first question then. Why is it that you get a response from Islam that goes into an office when it's insulted and shoots people up? Because that's their theology of suffering. It's fate and it's not good and you fight back. Why is it different? Why is a Christian response to being insulted and having our prophet, our saviour, hurt, maligned? Why is it different? Here's why it's different. This was Adam 4D, the, uh, the, the website, adam4d.com. There's the picture of the radical Muslim on the left. Do you see that? And his speech bubble says, if you don't accept Islam, it'll cost you your life. And the radical Christian leans in towards him from the other side and he says, I must tell you about Jesus even if it costs me my life. Why? Sounds crazy. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. And that's how he brought about salvation. And it's in following him that salvation becomes ours. By grace, through faith alone.